Walker, amen. Well, let's start off by singing number 302. 302, standing with me. I'll aim myself that way. Pardon my appearance again. I was out in, out in the duck line. We got a couple. Crazy day like today. There are millions of them up there, but... Anyway, number 302. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy glory crown brow. Lead me to Calvary. Lord, I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Show me the tomb where thou wast laid, tenderly mourned and wept. Angels in robes of light arrayed guarded thee whilst thou slept. Lest I forget Gethsemane, Lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Let me, like Mary, through the gloom come with the gift to Show to me now the empty tomb, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me. Calvary. May I be willing, Lord, to bear daily my cross for thee. Even thy cup of grief to share, thou hast borne all for me. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. And let's turn to 371. 371. Free from the law, oh, happy condition, Jesus hath bled, and there is remission. Cursed by the law, and bruised by the foe, grace hath redeemed us once for all. Once are all sinner receive it. Once for all, oh brother, believe it. Cling to the cross, the burden will fall. Christ hath redeemed us once for all. Now are we free there's no condemnation. Jesus proclaims a perfect salvation. 
Come unto me, oh, hear his sweet call. Come and he saves us once for all. Once for all, oh, sinner, receive it. Once for all, oh, brother, believe it. Cling to the cross, the burden will fall. Christ hath redeemed us once for all. Children of God, O oh, glorious calling, surely his grace will keep us from falling. Passing from death to life at his call. Blessed salvation once for all. Once for all, O oh, sinner, receive it. Once for all, O oh, brother, the cross, the burden will fall. Christ hath redeemed us once for all. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. Did y'all get a prayer bulletin? Ah, uh, they'll be on the back. If I bring them up here, everybody's looking in the back for them. <laughs> All right. Everybody else got one? Hey, pray for one another. We got some sick folks around here. And uh, um, between that and the weather out there, some folks not able to get out tonight. But I'm glad you're here. And my wife's been in bed all day. Uh, just, I mean, she didn't. I think she was up for about 20 minutes to drink a cup of coffee with me and read her Bibles together, and she went back to bed. She said, I'm giving up, and uh, went back to bed and has been in bed all day. So uh, made some chicken broth for her. I'm good at making chicken broth. You open up a can, you pour it in a bowl, put it in the microwave. Here, I cook something for you, honey. So, but you'd be in prayer for my wife. She's really, really not feeling well. And, you know, this is a busy time of year. Nobody wants, to be, nobody wants to be sick, period. But this is not the time of year you want to ever be sick. And so I appreciate your prayers for, for her. As we look at our, our prayer list tonight, we, it was good to see June uh, Herbert out for, for church and for different things and downstairs uh, yesterday for Bearing Precious Seed. And uh, a lot was done in Bearing Precious Seed yesterday, but it's good to see June out. And uh, it's always a blessing when you see somebody maybe getting a little bit better. So, okay, uh, I think on here also, uh, pray for Kevin and for Amy Crone. As they're dealing with COVID. Uh, Ashley has been sick, um, and the kids have been off and on, you know, so a lot of stuff going around. So, uh, yeah, pray for Ashley and for Kathy. Amen. All right, who has a prayer request tonight? Yes, ma'am. Great. Wow. Okay. Yeah, okay, so we'll pray for Jim. 
and we'll pray for Kiki. You know, I had a hard time calling him Kiki until I went out door to door knock and door knocking with him in his neighborhood. And I said, no, you know David, and they just laughed. They said, that's not David, that's Kiki. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I did a funeral one time, and the daughter's name nickname was Bubbles. <laughs> Try to say that with a straight face at a funeral, survived by his daughter Bubbles. <laughs> it was just, you know, but, you know, that's, that's what it is, so. Uh, yes, that definitely. Uh, David does need to be getting sick. With uh, he just about done with his therapy that he's been doing. He said he's got what I think two more, two more shots of it, uh, rounds of it, and uh, and he said he'll be uh, going with that. So you know, waiting to see how that's how that's done for him. So let's pray for for Kiki, A.K.A. David. All right. Anybody else prayer request tonight? Yes, ma'am, Nancy. Okay. Okay. Give us your son's name. Franklin Beardsley. You're having a pacemaker type thing. Yeah. Okay. So we'll just put a, a surgical procedure. Okay. For Franklin. All right, anybody else have a prayer request? Yes, ma'am. Jerry Ruby. Mrs. Crone. Oh, I'm telling you, they do. Oh, I'm telling you. Oh, when the kids were home, my wife said something sarcastic to me, sort of under her breath, and I, I, I looked, I, so, <laughs> I just went like that and looked at her, and they said, Mom, you can't get away with that anymore. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Oh, praise the Lord. It is a whole different, it's a whole, whole different situation. I can hear the timer go off on the coffee pot. That's wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. All kinds of life-changing things. Uh, but I did know to my every one of my kids, they came to me and said, Dad, this is so much better because I would get, I didn't realize it, but I would get frustrated, especially when there was a room full of people and there was a lot of chatter. I would have to say, wait, 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 you know, how do I, I can't even get involved in this conversation. You won't let me speak. Well, no, that wasn't it at all. I wasn't hearing clearly and was getting very frustrated with it, so, but uh, I wore them when I went out into the pond, and I, after I got out, I thought, I probably shouldn't have done that just in case I'd have done a header in the pond, but, uh, yeah, if you're wondering what's going on, I think you all, I think I told just about all of you, uh, we did find out what the problem is out here on the pond, and so it's pesky muskrats, and there's a 12-inch PVC that comes in there and it controls the level of the pond and uh, we uh, Matt and uh, Kendall and I kept looking around we couldn't find it could we Matt we had no idea where that thing was and then we're about done and I almost tripped over this uh, storm drain cover that's about a hundred feet the other side it's between the stop sign and the pond and sure enough if we pulled that off and looked down there and it was very obvious what the problem was all stuck full of sticks and all that kind of stuff so it's, it's holding us back so the county's supposed to be coming out as soon as they can to, to fix that. So, But anyway, yeah, that is a praise. I'm going to put this down as a praise, not about the muskrats, but about uh, my hearing aids. I'm just going to praise the Lord for that. And I delayed and put it off for, good heavens, for well over a year. And uh, I'm so glad that I went ahead and did it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes, sir. Remember, I used to, the first time I did one, I did it with a 
all good. Yeah, I got her beat sometimes. Yeah. Oh, terrific. All right. All right. We'll certainly praise the Lord about that. Okay, Katie's feeling better. Praise the Lord. All right. Anybody else? Prayer request? Bud. Okay, what is his name? Graham. See, I caught that. I caught that. Russell Graham. Okay, certainly. So there's the still, is he's having tests done for the kidney, uh, for the liver? Is that what he's doing? Okay. All right, we'll continue to pray for Russell then concerning that. Okay, anybody else? Yes. Yeah, yeah. She had pneumonia, didn't she? Yeah, that, that'll, that'll weaken you a little bit. Yeah, got to stop messing around with those birds. Yeah. They're feeding those birds today. Yeah. <laughs> All right, anybody else? Prayer request tonight. A lot, of, a lot of prayer requests tonight. That's that's good. We need to pray for one another. All right, any unspoken prayer requests tonight? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven unspoken prayer requests. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a moment here and you can pray. You won't have enough time to... to pray the entire list, but uh, maybe uh, pray for some of these on our list, and then we will, uh, I, I'm going to throw this out there. I'm going to just throw this out here. Uh, pray for Trinity Baptist Church in town. Let's pray for them, okay? Uh, the, the, the church has dwindled down to next to nothing, and I'm telling you, there is no glory for the other fundamental Baptist churches around here to see a fundamental Baptist church die. That's not, that's not a good thing. Now, I don't want any of you going down there. Uh, I want you to leave here. Uh, but uh, pray for Pastor Erickson, that God would give him wisdom. And uh, pray for the church. Uh, I would like to see their church thrive. I really would. And, uh, and you know, I, I have, some of you may have some, some situations that have developed over the years there. But I, I don't, so I'm just going to uh, be as gracious as I can. And we certainly need to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ there. Pray for Pastor Erickson, that God would give him wisdom. All right, let's do this. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and uh, then I will close in just a moment. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of prayer. So thankful, Lord, that we have a, a church that prays for one another. And Lord, I ask that you would be with our church body. Lord, help us spiritually to be healthy. 
thank you for the activity, the way things are moving forward, and folks that are being touched, and the spiritual growth that we're seeing, people influenced for the gospel, and for you. Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless our church, bless our church finances, Lord. I pray that you would bless our church building, even. Uh, Lord, all those things, Lord, we, as we want to go forward and serve you and be useful, uh, Lord, in, in your kingdom. Uh, Lord, I pray tonight for Pastor Erickson and for the Trinity Baptist Church, Lord, that you would give them some grace, Lord, and wisdom and how to proceed. Lord, watch over them. Lord, I pray for tonight for these that are on our list. Some of these folks have been on our list for quite a while. But yet, as we, we look at these, I pray for our sister Rose tonight. Thank you for the good news and, Lord, uh, the encouragement there. Uh, I pray, Lord, that you would touch her body. And God, we know that you are the healer. You're Jehovah Rapha. You're uh, the one who hears and answers prayer. And Lord, you said that the the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And yet, Lord, we come to you not in our own righteousness, but in the very righteousness of Jesus Christ, that righteousness that's been granted to us. We ask that you would touch Rose's body. Lord, we want to see her back here in church with us. Lord, I pray that you'd be with David. And uh, she's not feeling well. And also with his cancer and the effectiveness Lord I pray that you'd help the uh, the uh, procedures that he's gone through and uh, Lord that you would help him the radiation and things Lord that you would help him to uh, be able to be rid of this cancer Lord I pray for our sister Rita Collins who's just been so faithful here on, on Sunday mornings Lord and it's good to see her uh, but yet Lord we know that she's struggling so, Lord, I pray that you would be with her. I pray that you'd be with Roseanne tonight and her needs. And, Lord, I pray that you'd strengthen her body. I know that this kind of weather is hard on her and also on, on uh, many of our people. But we pray tonight specifically for her. We pray tonight, Lord, for K Kevin and Amy with COVID. We pray tonight for Ashley and Kathy and and Jim, and once again for Kiki, as they're just not feeling well, Lord, I pray that you would strengthen them. I pray tonight for Franklin Beardsley with this uh, uh, apparatus, whatever this is that he needs to have. Lord, I pray that that would all go smoothly. I pray tonight, Lord, for Jerry Ruby and Mrs. Crone as they're dealing with the sciatic nerve pain. Lord, uh, touch their bodies. I. I pray for Russell Graham, uh, Lord, as uh, he and his family are awaiting the, uh, the outcome of the biopsies and things that he's done. Lord, I, I ask, dear God, that you would touch his body. I pray that all of this would draw him close to you. Lord, we thank you that uh, Rose is doing better. We thank you for this home, home care that's coming in and helping her. Uh, Lord, I'm uh, I, I, so thankful, Lord, that she's getting some sleep. I thank you tonight, Lord, that Katie's feeling good for the first time in months. And Lord, uh, what a blessing that is. We thank you for her. Thank you that she's here and part of our church. And Lord, in a, uh, just in a grateful way, Lord, I thank you for these, uh, the simplicity of these hearing aids, Lord, and the way that you've allowed me to have them. And Lord, I thank you for that. We ask that you be with these unspoken requests and all these other things that are on our list, Lord. And, uh, that are going on. Bless each one, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. All righty. Let's take our Bibles tonight. And we're going to continue in our study of the doctrine of Christ. And uh, got quite a few scriptures to look at tonight. And I might, just to get through these, I might shoot a few of these scriptures out there for somebody else to look up, but we'll just, we'll see about that. I'm not sure if we're going to do that or not. And uh, tonight we're going to be looking at um, uh, the virgin birth, the incarnation of Christ. 
over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the, uh, the, the pre-existence of Christ. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ did not just appear at Bethlehem as if he was not in existence before that. And I believe that we've established in the Bible that even his sonship is eternal, meaning that he was the son of God before he was born in that stable. Uh, he was the son of God. Uh, the Bible says in, in, in John chapter 1, in verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, what's the next one? Was God. Okay? Uh, so really that is that uh, John 1, 1 really is the Genesis 1, 1 of the New Testament, declaring the preexistence of God and that this world was created on purpose by God. Now, a problem that we run into, and this is a problem for our public school teachers, this is a problem in our public schools, when we have secularized education, when we have secularized education and we tell people, we, we teach our children that in our public schools uh, uh, that, that uh, they're a product of chance, of evolution. And there's really nothing that separates us from the, we're part of the animal kingdom. Folks, let me tell you something now. We are not animals. So, uh, and, uh, and often uh, that same thing is, is taught that you can believe whatever you want to about God. We're not going to go there. And, but many times even, even the concept of God is ridiculed in, in, in uh, secular education. Now I have to stop, just put a colon there, dot, dot, and just say, that doesn't mean everybody involved in secular education are wicked people. I know some dear Christian people that do everything they can, but their hands are shackled. There's things that they cannot say and things that they cannot do. But if you're going to tell kids that they are, uh, that they are a, 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 a result of chance, you're going to tell them that, and you're going to tell them that there is no God, there is no heaven, there is no hell, there are no moral absolutes, and that they're part of the animal kingdom, what are you going to get? You're going to get people acting like animals. That, I mean, that's just the, that's the, the legitimate, that's the legitimate result of an illegitimate teaching. Okay, that's the obvious result to that. So uh, our kids that are in the public school, you pray for them. That's not easy. Uh, our uh, folks that go to even to a community college, we had the largest community college in the state of Iowa was right in Fort Dodge. And they had thousands of people in that community college, and it was considered a, a top-level community college. And some of our Christian kids would go to the college. Well, first semester, they got to take some philosophy class that goes directly against everything that we've been teaching them and everything that they've learned. And, 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 and many of them were homeschooled or went to the Christian school, and went, we had to try to prepare them before they went into there that what they're going to hear and how to... So you all be praying, praying for our, our public school teachers. You pray for our public school administrators. You pray for our school board members. Wouldn't it be something? Wouldn't it be just great to have a Crossroads Baptist Church church member on the school board? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? I think that would be a wonderful thing. And uh, uh, we sit back and gripe and complain about stuff. Um, you know, we, we've got to get involved. So uh, you, you see this, uh, this idea of Genesis 1, 1, John 1, 1, uh, like God is saying, first and foremost here, I want to make sure that you all understand this, is that uh, I've always been, and the Trinity has always been, I've I got to do that sometime, do a study on Genesis 1, 1, because that, that's uh, amazing, the, the name, just the word God, in the beginning, God reveals things, created Oh, it's just amazing doing a word study on Genesis 1.1. But Jesus is as old as God because he is God. Okay? Now, you may uh, think, and I, I've sort of thought this a little bit, maybe that's too simplistic of a statement. You all here are mature Christians and you've been around for a while and you already understand that. But I'm telling you, folks, things that are that important we cannot take for granted. We've got to go back and hit it again. 
and hit it again and hit it again. If you take, the Bible refers to Jesus Christ as being the chief cornerstone. You take the chief cornerstone out, the house is going down. The house is going down. So we must be strong on the doctrine of Christ. Okay, I'm finding that we have some Christian brothers down here at the Christian Reformed Church, and we have some Christian brothers over here at the Presbyterian Church, and we have some Christian brothers and sisters at different churches, and we disagree on, on, on several things, but we agree on the Lord Jesus Christ, and we agree on salvation. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, I will debate them, and I am not going to swallow false doctrine. But I'm telling you something, folks. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have eternal life. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. In one of those verses, he hath not life, and the wrath of God abideth on him. So we must be right on Jesus. I, uh, uh, I want to point something out. Uh, hopefully we'll get beyond this. Uh, look over in Daniel chapter 3. We're talking about the... Uh, we're going to get into the virgin birth. We are, I promise. Maybe not very for very long, but we're going to get into it. I want to go back on this because I didn't, I didn't emphasize this. Daniel chapter 3. Now I want you to look in verse 25. We're talking about the pre-existence of the Lord Jesus Christ and His eternal Sonship. And this is the fiery furnace, and you probably know right where I'm going here, but I'm going to go there. Uh, you see in verse 25, he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose. This is Nebuchadnezzar. He said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form, remember they put three men in, and now they see four. The form of the fourth is like the Son of God. This is an Old Testament appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now here's the problem. If you've got an English standard version of the Bible, an ESV, which is the latest something that has been embraced by many, many churches, many denominations, the ESV, or if you have the old version that was accepted by many denominations and such, the NIV, that will say, instead of the, the form of the fourth is like the Son of God, it will say, like a son of the gods. Okay? And I just looked it up. I looked it up today, just so I... Things that are different are not the same. There's a big difference between the Son of God and a son of the gods. Now, here's the, here's the rationale that they use. Okay, the rationale that they use in putting that the son, a, a son of the gods is that some of the terminology in there, some of the, 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 the archaic words, the, the, the original words, the, the Chaldean or the uh, Hebrew words, mean it could say one or the other. Now, I just want to tell you something. If you could say one or the other, why would you, change, why would you go with the one that does not support the deity, the preexistence of Christ? Now, I could go a long way on that tonight. But if you look in your passage of Scripture, I believe that the passage of Scripture here um, does refer to this. Look in, look in verse 17. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which was their Babylonian, Babylonian names, and Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael were their Hebrew names. Um, Daniel was Belteshazzar. That was his name in Babylonian, but we don't refer to him as that. So we have these three Hebrew children, we say, and they probably were adults, uh, saying, giving testimony that our God will save us. Now, look in 
verse 26. After this effect, so they, they told Nebuchadnezzar that. And then in verse 26, Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God. Do you see that there? Come forth and come hither. Now, what is said is that Nebuchadnezzar was, uh, uh, was polytheistic. What that means is they had many gods. They had a god for everything. Okay, and you'll find many cultures that are like that. Everything's a god. They'll have a, uh, you know, a, uh, uh, you know, a candle god or something, a fire god. They'll have, you know, uh, uh, what are these called? Point set of gods. Okay, they'll worship that because there's a point set of god. Okay, and really the Babylonians were like that. But what we see in the context here, so they say, well, he probably it makes sense that he would have said this, uh, a son of the gods. But in its context, he has been confronted with the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He's been confronted by this. Uh, it is very rare for a religion to be monotheistic. That means there's only one God. And that was what the Jews stood on. The Israelites stood on that. There's only one God. And God made that very clear. I am God alone. And so uh, we see that they declared that to Nebuchadnezzar. And then Nebuchadnezzar said that right back to them, ye servants of the Most High God. And then look in verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies and so on. So what I'm thinking here, there is, there, there certainly, there certainly in its context was referring to the God of Israel. It wasn't some fire God. It wasn't some too hot to handle God. It was not uh, all of these different gods that, that he was considering. He was considering the very God that we're studying right now. And what he saw was a, a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is referred to as a theophany. You'll be tested on that later, okay? It's a theophany, an Old Testament appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ, many places, several places anyway, and referred to as the angel of the Lord, okay? Um, so you can tell in the Old Testament if it's, if it's Jesus, one way that you can tell is if he allows himself to be worshiped. That is something that you see with other the angels when it's just an angel coming as a messenger and they go to worship. They, oh, no, 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 don't worship me. I'm a messenger. There are times in the Old Testament where they worship and it's allowed. You know why? Because that was God. That was Jesus Christ. So Jesus didn't just happen to a poof, to appear in Bethlehem. So he is pre-existent. I want to just take a few minutes on that just to explain that to you. And uh, because that, I, I believe that there is a big difference between those two phrases. Uh, I keep threatening, and someday I'm going to do it. I'm going to uh, do a study on, uh, on, the, uh, on Scripture, on the Bible, and the history of the Bible and the King James Bible. All right, now let's look at the incarnation of Christ or the birth of Christ at uh, Bethlehem, where the Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us okay so uh very important this is very important if you don't have the virgin birth all you have is a man and no god if uh if jesus wasn't virgin born then if he was not the sinless god he would have been a sinful man you have no redemption you have no salvation if jesus christ was not virgin born the books of Isaiah, Matthew, Luke, Luke, and John are all fake because they specifically, I believe you'll find them all the way through Scripture, but they specifically point out the virgin birth. So I tell you what, folks, if you start cutting stuff out of your Bible because somebody said that wasn't right, you're not going to have much Bible left. I was asked about that at one point, actually one of my daughters, because, you see, we all wind up coming to conclusions. We have to come. At some point, it's not the pastor's faith. At some point, it's not mom and dad's faith or that person that led you to Christ's faith. You have to come to the point where it's your faith. And uh, 
And my explanation to my kids is that uh, I believe that the Bible is the Word of God, and I believe that every Word of God, I believe that every Word of God, I believe that every Word of God is pure. Uh, that means that it's not wiped away because of dispensationalism. It's not weakened by dispensationalism. So, well, that was for that age, and that was for, oh, sure, we have to do, rightly divide the Word of Truth, but don't tell me, don't, you don't have to pay attention to that passage of Scripture. There's something there for every one of us. I got a blessing reading the book of Amos what, what, about six or eight weeks ago. Read through the book of Amos. And, I mean, minor prophets. <sighs> when are we going to get through these? And, I mean, it seemed like it just shot out to me several things in the book of Amos. You'll hear some sermons out of the book of Amos. Uh, but uh, you'd have to cut those things out. Be careful about that. Be careful about somebody getting up and saying, that would be better translated... Because what they just did is they elevated themselves about the preser above the preservation of the Word of God. And if God, uh, almost, almost every Christian that I know would say that God, in the original manuscripts, the, every Word of God is pure. Well, if that's the case and we don't have it now, God owes us an apology and He cannot hold us to the same standard that He held somebody else to. So either God gave it and preserved it or God didn't give it. So, if Christ is not virgin born, you'd have to just go. <laughs> Saw an evangelist one time. He got up and he said, Well, you just have to take that out of your Bible, <laughs> rip the page out, and water it up, threw it on the floor. And he said, Oh, yeah, yeah there's no one. <laughs> he said, You don't like that? Well, just ripped it up, threw it on the floor. And everybody's doing this like you're doing, going, I can't believe he did that. Well, then later on, he just said, Here, he said, This is just a cover. He pulled it out, and it was some paperback book, okay? But uh, uh, rip it out. Rip it out. Good way to get people's attention. Yeah, I got known. I, I tried that. I got known in our community as the pastor that tears up Bibles, and uh, that wasn't a good thing. The doctrine of the virgin birth of Christ is a cardinal doctrine. A cardinal doctrine. It's one of the fundamentals of our Baptist faith. It's one of the fundamentals of Christian faith specifically Christian and you don't believe in Christ it just it's just senseless so we're going to look at this for a moment okay okay uh, uh, first of all tonight let's look at this reasons for the virgin birth of Jesus Christ and we're going to look at several different scriptures here look over in Revelation chapter 13 in verse 8 Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written, and this is talking about the beast, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, we see this, then, this slain from the foundation of the world. It does not necessarily mean that Jesus was crucified before he was crucified. Now, I don't really understand this, the whole timeline with God, because with God, things don't run like this. Things run like this. Okay, I don't really, I, I have a hard time understanding all of that. But what I, what I can simply come from that was that the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ was predetermined before there ever was a creation. Okay? So it's like you have the leg on the table as far as creation goes. And so we're just going to rip one of those legs out uh, from the table if we say that Jesus was not going to be virgin born and uh, die for the... If, once again... If there's no virgin birth, there's no sense in a crucifixion. There's no sense in a sacrifice. Because it would be no different than a sacrifice of a, of a lamb or a goat that you see in the Old Testament. It had to be a sinless sacrifice. So this was done before the foundation of the world. So um, he's slain from, from the foundation of the world. So why did he come? We see this. There's, he, he came. Uh, there are many biblical reasons for this. 
uh, but we see that he, uh, uh, he had some point, the Lord Jesus Christ had to come. It was predetermined. So first, uh, to confirm the promises of God. Why was Jesus Christ, why did Jesus Christ have to be born of a virgin to confirm the promises of God? Here's Revelation chapter 15 and verse 8. It says this, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. There's a, there's a book out, it's, it's it's an old book. It's like a Matthew Henry type of a thing. It was by a fellow by the name of Edersheim. And it's really, it's usually in two volumes, but it, I've seen it in one volume and it looks like a dictionary. Okay, it's, a, it's on the life of Christ, Edersheim's life of Christ. And Edersheim claims that there are 456 promises about or statements about the Lord Jesus Christ that are found in the Old Testament, 456. Uh, now, what I've, what I've done is I've just sort of taken a look. I have not looked at every one of these. I'm not the guy that went and searched all of this out. But what I did do is compare what different theologians have said. There are at least 300 prophecies about Christ in the Old Testament. At least 300 of them. Um, the, the first one would be in Genesis 3. 15 about uh, about the, the when it, when the curse and about the serpent and how that uh, the seed of the woman was going to crush the serpent's head and but the, and the serpent was going to bruise his heel and I believe that that's a direct reference to crucifixion so many things there about that uh, crucif you know that the Jews did not crucify do you know anybody know how the Jews would kill somebody if they're going to kill him Stone them. That's what they would do. They would stone them. Well, Jesus wasn't stoned by the crowd. Remember, a couple of times they wanted to. They picked up stones. They were going to stone him. But Jesus sort of just passed through the crowd. Jesus sort of, just not today, guys, and walked away. I don't quite understand that either. Uh, uh, but uh, we see this, uh, this first statement, and it says here in Genesis 3.15, I'm going to look at it. I'm going to read it. I don't have that written down here. And, um, but this is a prophecy, and that's the first prophecy dealing with the Lord Jesus Christ. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. This is talking to the serpent. It shall bruise thy head. What shall bruise thy head? The seed of, of the woman. And thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, it may not seem like that's a big deal that it says the seed of the woman, but that's typically not the way that things go in the Bible. It's the son, this and, and so-and-so begat so-and-so, and it's usually the lineage and such goes through the man because that's the, that's the recognized blood lineage between the, the man and the, the son, okay? And it, it goes that way. Well, here it talks about the seed of the woman, it excludes the man, giving the door, leaving the door wide open for the virgin birth. There's not a man involved here. So that is the first promise that we see referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, then over in Isaiah chapter 9, and some of these you hear around this, this time of year, of course. In Isaiah chapter 9 and verse uh, 6, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, uh, the scripture says here, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of the hosts will perform it. So here we have a prophecy. Uh, we see over in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 where it talks about Bethlehem, how Jesus was going to be born in Bethlehem. All of these things, many of these things go counter to what the culture would say. It'd be one thing to say, yeah, you know, it's going to snow this winter. Well, look at there, I'm a prophet. It snowed. 
Okay, that would be something very obvious, and it was a game that many of the prophets, the false prophets, used. Okay, but these prophecies, Jesus, that's pretty specific. Jesus being born in Bethlehem? And then we start looking at some of those, and, uh, and the Bible talks about him coming out of Egypt. The Old Testament prophecy about him coming out of, how could he be born in Bethlehem and come out of Egypt? So these are things that are Old Testament prophecies that are very specific about the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the, uh, I, I believe that in the, the, the prophecy, Daniel's prophecy, the 70 weeks of Daniel, okay, I, we, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big deal. That's, we, would, we could spend a year uh, looking at the 70 weeks of Daniel prophecy. But I believe that the Bible and Daniel, chap, uh, I, I, I can't remember what chapter it is, chapter 10, chapter 11, 70 weeks of Daniel, and what's going on there is I believe that it even tells the year that Jesus was going to be born. I believe it's in there. You look in there, it's very specific from the, uh, what is it, from the uh, 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 building, of the, of the tab, uh, building of the wall or something like that. I can't remember exactly how it all goes. And if you go through there and figure that thing out, it comes down to pinpointing when Jesus Christ was going to come. Now that's not some hocus pocus about the second coming of Christ, okay? When somebody tells you, I know when Jesus is coming, he's, he's not going to come then, okay? Because the Bible says no man knoweth, okay? So, uh, but here, they didn't say that about his first coming. And the Bible is very explicit about many things that were signs to confirm that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so you have the Old Testament prophecies. And Jesus fulfills over 300 Old Testament prophecies. So that's one of the reasons why he, I'm so glad that I can have my confidence, once again, in this book. Seems to be a little bit of a theme here tonight. I can have my confidence in this book. One of the reasons why I know I can have my, conf, my, my confidence in this book, if there are prophecies about the Lord Jesus Christ, that are so specific that no man would have been able to guess on that. So why did Jesus come? One of the reasons why Jesus had to come is because I've been telling everybody he was coming for a long time. And specifically how he was going to come. And so uh, you sort of, you know, uh, you make a promise to somebody. I'm going to be here at such and such a time. I'll meet you there at such and such a time and we're all fallible, and we make mistakes, and sometimes we don't keep our word. The promises of God are sure. And so to confirm the promises of God, that, uh, that incarnation, that birth of Christ here, that virgin birth of Christ, is something that was promised in God's word. So that's our, our first reason for the incarnation of Christ. Uh, second is to save sinners. To save sinners. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was, anybody know? Lost. He came not to set up His kingdom on this earth. He came for the purpose of saving sinners. Uh, another scripture that says that, that's Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 15 says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Jesus that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I didn't write the rest of that. Is that where he says, of whom I am chief? I believe it is. He came to save sinners. That was mighty important for him. I love it. I love it. Just to think that before there was ever an Adam and Eve, before the, the light was separated from the darkness, before there was ever an animal kingdom, uh, before there was ever, ever a human being, ever a sunrise, ever a sunset, before there was any of that, Jesus Christ had said, I will go. God knew before creation that Adam and Eve were going to sin. Well, why would the lamb have to be slain before the foundations of the world? If he didn't already know that. So he came to save sinners. Folks, if Jesus was that interested in it, maybe we should be. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad somebody told you about Jesus Christ, how to go to heaven? 
I'm glad. First generation of my family that grew up going to church like that, faithfully. I, I thank God for my Sunday school teachers. I thank God for my mom and dad. I thank God for my junior church teachers. I remember them. Okay, it's a long time ago. I'm going to be 60. I'm going to be 60 in May. Some of you are looking at me and say, ah, you're just a pup. Yeah. Okay, I'll be 60 in May. I still remember those. And you know what they did? They taught me that I needed to be saved. What a wonderful thing. My grandkids, uh, we got a group of them, uh, sort of a lump of them that are four and five years old, you know, coming through. And, uh, you know, like, anyway. And uh, it's not uncommon to get a phone call and say, Dad, um, Chloe's been asking some questions. Or Ryan's been asking some questions. And of course, if Chloe and Ryan are going to ask questions, then Jack is going to ask questions. And over here, Earl's asking questions. Emma's asking questions. Oh my. What are they asking questions about? Heaven. They're getting kind of concerned about hell. They're recognizing that they're sinners which is a prerequisite to being saved. you got to know that you're a sinner. You must know that you're a sinner. We can't soft-pedal that for our kids, and we can't say to our kids, now just say, what, say these words after me as if it's a magical charm or magical chant of some type that if you get the words right, you're going to go to heaven. No, it's, it's right from here. It's not even from here. It's right from here. So... He came to save sinners. Why else did he come? To reveal God the Father. He came to reveal God the Father. John chapter 1 and verse 18 says, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son hath declared him. We see that over in John chapter 1. Um, oh, look in John chapter 14. I want to look there. John chapter 14. I wrote a little booklet years ago. I think I was still pastoring in Roger City, and I sort of edited it a couple of times on leading a child to Christ. If anybody's interested in that, I think I've got three or four copies of that in my, in my office. And so I do. I get phone calls from people from time to time. They ask me about that. Are they ready? Are they ready? And I said, are they worried? Do they understand that they're a sinner? If they, don't, if they will not admit, if a child will not admit that they're a sinner, they can't be saved. They're not ready yet. And uh, probably if they still believe in Santa Claus, you're going to have a little bit of trouble. Okay. Um, where did I say? Where are we? John chapter 14. Look in verse 8. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus say, saith unto him, Have I been so long with you, long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? We see the Old Testament, and we see God the Father in the Old Testament, and we see some appearances of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we also see uh, some appearances of the Holy Spirit, where the Spirit would come upon people. The Spirit did not necessarily indwell people. The Spirit would come upon people in the Old Testament. So we have the Trinity in the Old Testament. But what the folks, the, the difference between, there's many things different between the Old Testament and New Testament. One thing about the Old Testament, the Old Testament was completely saturated with the law. Thou must, thou must, thou must, thou must. You've got to do this, 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 you've got to do this. Now Jesus Christ came and Jesus didn't necessarily do away with the law. The Bible tells us that he fulfilled the law. In other words, all those things, and the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to, does anybody know? Yeah, it's supposed to bring, I believe it's to Christ. Okay, yeah, it's our schoolmaster. Why? I can't do this. So the whole Old Testament, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it with a hope of what was coming, of who was coming. And now we get to be able to say, uh, we know him. We know the one who saved us. Do you have a relationship with him? I hope you do. I hope you have a close relationship with him. That's what the Bible wants us to have. 
So Jesus, so we have him as the word. We have him as a voice. We have him as a being that cannot be touched. But then it's as if the manifestation of God couldn't hold back anymore. And so God is revealed to us in Jesus Christ. You want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus Christ. You want to know the emotions of God? Look at Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ manifests the Father. What he did is he reveals God the Father to us. So the scripture, all during the Old Testament, is he's, he's, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. It doesn't say it quite this way in the New Testament, but it was as if John the Baptist said, Shazam! There he is! Golly! There he is! Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, and every single Jew knew exactly what he was talking about when he said that. And it revealed the Father to the world. We're going to have to end there. We're going to talk about a bunch more. All right, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this this, uh, uh, simple but yet profound study. We thank you, Jesus, for everything that you've done for us. Thank you for being our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you that you have revealed the Father to us. We thank you that you have fulfilled the promises so that now we can have confidence in your word. We thank you, uh, dear Lord, uh, that you came to seek and to save sinners. Thank you for that day uh, years ago in that uh, in 1972 where I trusted you as my Savior, as a nine-year-old boy at camp. And Lord, I thank you for that. And it's a personal thing to me. And I thank you that you planned that before there was ever a human being. You planned for my salvation. I thank you for that, Lord Jesus. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.